Beautiful Sunday morning. Great to see you all here this morning. Um, I want to uh, go ahead and clarify uh, something. Mark said I was going to Egypt uh, last week and um, didn't give an end to that. So no, I'm not just going to fly off to Egypt and never come back. Um, but uh, I wanted to let you know what's going on uh, so you can be praying for me and also praying for uh, a number of other Christians who are going to be going on this trip. Uh, so uh, I uh, am doing uh, ongoing studies through Freed Hardeman University, one of, the, one of our uh, schools in our brotherhood and a really good school. Um, I, uh, um, in, in that program, there is a teacher uh, who um, had, a, had a life as a doctor before becoming a, a teacher. And uh, in that life as a doctor, um, he uh, actually did quite well for himself. And he decided that he was going to, to give back to uh, the brotherhood in a special way. He wanted to see that, that more uh, people who were dedicated to ministry were more convinced of the reality of the Bible and how the Bible intersects with, with uh, history. And so um, he uh, trained himself. He went back to school and got another uh, doctorate. And, um, and then uh, with the sole purpose of going to Fried Hardeman and teaching Bible archaeology. And um, uh, so uh, what we were supposed to actually do, uh, and a little sad that we're not going to be doing this, is we're supposed to go to Israel and, uh, and go dig in one of the historical places over there. Uh, that, unfortunately, is not going to happen because of the situation over there. And that's a reminder to continue to continually, uh, pray about that situation and the uh, lack of peace in the Middle East. Uh, but uh, he pivoted and uh, decided that he was going to take us to Egypt instead. And, um, and, and so this is a, um, a special blessing. Um, we were asked to only give a very small amount towards the trip. And uh, so just a really special opportunity. I'm thankful to the elders for letting me do this and uh, have this time away. And then uh, thankful to you guys for putting up with it as well. And uh, just be praying for us. Uh, pray for all the students free that are going. And this trip is actually something that a number of other uh, Christians are going to be going on as well. Um, and we're going to be going uh, to various historical places in Egypt with the aim of seeing how the, the, the story of Israel intersects with the uh, nation of Egypt and its history. So uh, be praying for our safety and that uh, that all goes well. Um, so this morning we're going to talk about building our hopes on things eternal as we begin our reflections this summer on hope. I thought it was good to sort of uh, take a step back and reflect upon the nature of biblical hope. We mentioned this last Sunday and we talked about a mother's hope, and I'll remind you now, and I'll probably remind you over the course of this summer, that when we think about biblical hope, it is not wishful thinking. It's an expectation and a desire. But it's an expectation and desire that's predicated on our action. You, you can't hope and be inactive. And so it's important that we, we, first of all, cast our hopes upon God, and then be prepared to embrace God's opportunity in any given situation to find hope. Our plan for the course of the summer is to talk about various circumstances and situations in which we find ourselves that seem to be hopeless. Things like indebtedness, things like sickness, things like death, things like uh, conflict in relationships, things like difficulties that come up in marriages. So we're hoping to talk about those things uh, throughout the course of the summer. But if we aren't convinced that there is some kind of security in God in those moments, then we're not going to be convinced of his solutions. And so we have to talk about building our hopes on things eternal. Time is filled with swift transition. You ever really experienced that? You know, an hourglass is kind of deceptive because an hourglass convinces you that time is sort of linear. It just kind of, it, it always travels at the same rate. Those grains always fall at a predictable pattern, and, and time just moves along in a very predictable kind of way. I don't know about you, but I have found that even though hourglasses do function as they are designed, that my experience with time is very, very different than that. That, that, that time is really a broken concept in a lot of ways. I think about times that go by too quickly, you know, um, one of my favorite things in the world is having a sleeping baby right here. That, that, that's, that's like the best thing in the world. But it's occurred to me, the more of these babies that I have, that there always comes a time when that just doesn't happen anymore. It's gone. And I'm always left wondering, where did it go? It, it went by too fast. And um, you know why it goes. I mean, there comes a point where you can't breathe when they try to do that on top of you, and they don't want to do it anyway. And, and, and so it just, just goes, and it's gone, and, and you say, where did it go? And then there's, there's other times. I, I think about the time when uh, I had a third-degree sprain in my ankle, and it was excruciating. And 
I had no idea when it was ever going to be done. I remember, you know, weeks and weeks of walking and hobbling around on this really, really painful leg and just wondering, when is this going to be done? When am I going to be able to move on from this? And that time seemed to last forever. Time does that. Time is not constant. In fact, it's filled with swift transition. And if there's anything that uh, convinces us that, about time and its nature is that there is nothing that, that, that is permanent and that can withstand the, the passing of time. And usually we experience in terms of our, our, our lives, uh, the breakdown of our body, um, the, the, the changing of things that we enjoy. And um, it can be very easy to be bitter in all of that and not be hopeful at all. So let's reflect upon what we need to do with this reality that time is what it is and what we need to do with the reality that there is a hope that can permeate these moments and transform them. Let's talk about awareness, first of all, relative to time. We're going to be bouncing back between uh, two biblical texts, the one that we read, Psalm 90, and then the simple thoughts that are contained in Ephesians 5, 15, and 16 relative to time. So Ephesians 5, 15, and 16 say, uh, or rather says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Various translations can remember, uh, render that redeeming the time a little bit differently. I like the way that it's rendered there in the New King James because it reminds you of the, the, the actual picture of this, that, that there is, there, time is an entity that has to be bought back from other purposes and has to be used in profitable ways. And, and that, that really kind of surrounds, the, the, the thoughts that surround that are built upon that idea. We need to walk circumspectly with awareness, not as foolish people, because foolish people allow their time to be taken and wasted, and they allow the opportunities to be missed. The days are evil in potential. They don't have to be that way in reality, but the default setting is for them to be evil. So as you think about awareness, see then that you walk circumspectly is the first thought that I really want to highlight from this verse. Circumspection is the idea of, of being aware of what's going on, you know, looking around. You get the, you know, you can break that word apart, uh, the circumference of something, the surrounding of something, and then the, the uh, uh, spect part of that, the spectacles looking. So, so look around, have eyes all around you aware of what is going on. That's the call of the text. And that really is the major message that's given in the reading that we just had from Psalm 90. So open up your Bibles to Psalm 90, and we'll, we'll highlight a few things as we work through some of the thoughts of this text. Psalm 90, the wise words that are attributed here uh, to Moses, a man of God. Psalm 90. So the psalmist is aware uh, of the impermanence of man. In verse number 3, he says, you turn man to destruction and say, return, O children of men. Well, what do you mean, return, O children of men? When you think about the, the, the reality post-Eden, when we're separated from the tree of life, what happens? We came from dust, and to dust we will return. And so God says, effectively, return. And this is in the context of mortality. You can see that from the statements that are surrounding this thought and uh, the idea of being taught about the, the length of our years. In verse number five, it says, you carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. The life passes as though it were asleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and withers. Grass grows, grass falls. It all happens very quickly, and so is life. In fact, uh, verse number five reads a little bit differently. Instead of being like a sleep, it says in the English Standard Version, like a dream. You know, dreams kind of come and go, and you always wonder where they went, and you have a hard time holding on to them. I remember uh, so many dreams, but I don't remember them. I have them, and I'm like, oh, that was really interesting. I want to remember that, and then I forget it. And I want to tell Chantel about that, but then I forget it. And that's the way that dreams go, and that's the way that life can go. We die very quickly, it says in verse number 10. The days of our lives are 70 years. Maybe by reason of strength, they might be 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. There's always a task that pushes us forward. And it's easy to get caught up in that task and then find ourselves to be cut off, die, and then we fly away. But all of this is contrasted in this psalm with some other thought. With the thoughts surrounding God and who he is. In verse number four, it says, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. What 
seems to be very quick to us in terms of our life, God has a much bigger perspective, and God doesn't experience our reality. He is the constant in the face of our inconstancy. Man is impermanent, though, for a reason. The reason that is given in the psalm is the wrath of God. In verse number 7, For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are terrified. Why are we mortal? Why does life come to an end? Well, life comes to an end because of sin. The wages of sin is death. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, And so the wrath of God is how this is pictured in this psalm. Now, it says here uh, that God has wrath. By your wrath we are terrified. But it doesn't say that God is wrath. That's a very important thing to recognize about this psalm. Because, you know, why would you turn to a God and, and cast any hope or, or, or desire or expectation upon this God if God were merely wrathful? Well, God is not wrathful. What is God? God is love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, God is love. So God has wrath, but God is not wrath. God is love. We need to reflect upon that because the psalmist certainly has. He's not upset because of who God is. He's upset because of who he is in contrast to his God. Wrath is revealed for a good reason. It's revealed because of the unrighteousness of men. There's, again, the wages of sin is death. And in verse number 8, it says, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sin in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath, and we finish our years like a sigh. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the unrighteousness, the ungodliness of men. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. That, that's the reason it's there. But it's not who God is or what God desires. And if there were not sin, there would be no wrath. An awareness, then, of, imper uh, of impermanence ought to create an awareness of wrath. In verse number 11, it says, Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. The fear of you. What is the fear of you? God's fearlessness or the fear may be caused by you. Well, the fear of you, if it's God's fearlessness or if it's the fear that is caused by God, both of these things are eternal, right? Do we ever lose our fear of God in terms of respecting his power and ability? No. Do we ever, do we ever um, you know, look at God and say, he's afraid, he's, he's chosen uh, to, to cower in this moment and not shown himself to be courageous? Well, no. You know, whenever we think about God, he's associated with courage and he calls us to it. So if these things are eternal... What does that say about our God? That in the face of this impermanent and very quickly passing life, God is permanent. And if the fear of God is permanent, then the wrath of God could potentially also be permanent. And that's really what life is all about. It's recognizing that if God is a being to be respected and desired, then he is a being to be respected in light of the negative things about him too. I don't want to be on the side of God's wrath. I want to instead abide in his love. This is not a psalm, again, lamenting the human condition. It's a psalm asking God for wisdom. And so in verse number 12, the key thought of this is the same as the thought in Ephesians 5, 15, and 16. We need to walk circumspectly about the times in which we live, about our lives, uh, because there's the potential to see those days be evil and to be fools. In Psalm 90, the prayer is this, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In verse number three, man will return to dust. And so teach us to number our days. And that's really the, what, we, what we sang about, right? Time is filled with swift transition. Nothing of earth unmoved can stand. And so what do we want to do? We want to build our hopes on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand. So, so the, the, the call of this text this morning, uh, Psalm 90, Ephesians 5, 15, and 16, and even what you sang to each other, the call really is to wake up and be aware about this moment. And so with our awareness, what do we do? The two things that the psalm is going to direct us toward, and really a couple of implications of Ephesians 5, 16, as, uh, 15, and 16 as well. If we have awareness, then action is needed. You see, the call is to not walk as fools, but as wise. But the call ultimately also is to walk. 
See then that you walk circumspectly. You don't live very long until you're made aware of death. You know, I think we all have that memory of the first time that death comes into the picture for us, and we don't really get it. Um, I, I hear my boys talk about death kind of very casually. They saw death very early as they see, you know, older folks in the congregation pass away, and they understand that person is gone, but they don't really know what that means yet. We get an awareness of death, but then as we come to grips with what that really means, the call for us is to reflect upon, again, the reality of God's wrath, a wrath because you, you don't live as a Christian very long also without realizing the existence of God's wrath. So I don't want to die in a position of wrath, but instead I need to walk and make the most of our time to literally buy it back, to seize the opportunity. This is the biblical equivalent of carpe diem, right? Seize the day, redeem the time, the reason because the days are evil. And even when Jesus lived on this earth, he understood this dynamic of seizing each moment, making the most of each moment, right? In John chapter 9 and verse number 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Jesus knew what time meant. He knew there was going to come a time when he wasn't going to be able to work. He knows there's a time when every person is going to be unable to work. And so we have to do what we can while we can. Evil days can come very quickly, and they can lead very quickly to night, and at night no one can work. So action is needed. But walk circumspectly. Well, what action? You know, work the works of God, John chapter 9, verse 4. What does that mean? So often in terms of our, our uh, thinking about these things, we... we uh, um, we fall prey into, uh, you know, thinking about a couple of things and kind of satisfy ourselves with those things, and then don't really ever think about them, sadly. I, I have noticed that what is said too often actually is uh, as dangerous as what is not said at all. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed that, uh, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in particular about what we do when we talk about acting for the Lord. What are the three things, right? We, we talk about reading our Bible. Uh, we talk about praying, and we talk about telling others about Jesus. Those are usually the three things. You know, you're going to walk circumspectly. Those are the three things you do. You read your Bible, you pray, you talk about Jesus. And, and then again, what we, we talk about very often becomes something that we, we just really don't pay attention to. We don't have the phenomena of the, of the sliding songbooks. But I noticed at congregations, be, you know, where I've attended in the past that a, a lot of places will end a lesson with a rote uh, plan of salvation, like the hear, believe, repent, and be baptized, and all the verses will be attached with those things. That's incredibly useful information. In fact, uh, Lee gave us a lesson where he focused on that in particular. It's good to do that from time to time. Uh, but, you know, we, 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 uh, what, what I noticed in these congregations was that when the preacher shifted gears into that moment, like you would hear this thunder of the songbooks flying out, and, and uh, the lightnings clashed, and the thunder roared, and and, every, and and what happens while that thunder is roaring of all those songbooks going out is that nobody's actually paying attention to that anymore, and you would be surprised how few people could repeat and give those scripture references that they had been hearing week after week after week after week. What's said too often is really the same as what's not said at all. We do need to pray. We do need to study our Bibles. We do need to evangelize, but that's not the only action that is, needs to be undertaken. And really what needs to be undertaken is a more purposeful decision to in all ways, as the song says, build our hopes on things eternal. And to get very, very practical with that idea in every facet and aspect of our lives. Did you notice what happened? Uh, I'm assuming it happened up here because it certainly happened in Arizona during the pandemic. You go to the grocery store and there was like nothing there. All right, that can happen sometimes because the road breaks down and there's, the trucks aren't coming. You go to, go to the grocery store and like, where did all the apples go? There's no apples. But, um, you know, that, but that was a, a very regular occurrence during the pandemic. You go to the grocery store and there's nothing there. Why is there nothing there? It's not because there wasn't anything there to begin with. It's because... What happened was that people would go to the store and they would go, wow, and just, just swipe everything off the, off the counters. They would, they would take everything. And what, what, what led to that? I remember uh, before all that happened, um, I, well, we were actually on a road trip while all of that was developing and um, uh, went out to uh, Texas to do a, uh, to, uh, do a wedding. And um, 
I remember we stopped at Costco while we were there in Texas and I saw this dude like with like a whole shopping cart full of hand sanitizer. And I was like, what on earth is he doing? Is he like going to bathe himself in that stuff? You know, like, like I, it just was such a bizarre scene to, to, to look at that. And then I was like, yeah, ha, ha, ha. and then I went back home and, and, uh, and then um, was, I, was, I saw the, you know, the people with the shopping trolleys of toilet paper. Ha, ha, ha. And then I, and I came to realize, wait, there's no toilet paper. <laughs> there's no kid done there. And, um, you know, it just this, this strange phenomenon of people just grabbing everything. Why were they doing that? Well, well some were interested in profit. They were actually going to turn around and sell those things. But really, a lot of people, most people, I think, were trying to look for security that their security was upended and they needed that security. They needed to, to hold on to something because really what was true of them? Their, their, their hopes were not built on things eternal. And that, that moment exposed it. They did not have eternal hopes. And so they grabbed and they grabbed and they grabbed. What are we doing right now? Because really what happened during the pandemic was an exaggeration of what really was always there. An exaggeration of how people would behave in other situations given the same opportunity. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. What is mammon? Physical things. It means kind of wealth, but it doesn't just mean wealth. It's all physical things. You can't serve God in physical things. There's a reason why the song uh, that, uh, about time being filled with swift transition and holding to God's unchanging hand doesn't dwell upon those typical things of praying and studying our Bible and evangelizing. Those things are incredibly important, but it really comes down to where our security lies, what we are, what we are focused upon, where our hope is. And so that song, you remember what it said? Covet not this, vein's world, this world's vain riches that so rapidly decay. Seek to gain the heavenly treasures, they will never pass away. And so really, if we're going to build our hopes on things eternal, if God is going to be the place of our hope, there are some logical actions that need to follow that, that will lead to prayer and Bible study and evangelism, of course. But the action, first of all, of, of being content with what you have being satisfied with the, the position that God has placed you in in life, being satisfied whether you have a lot or you have a little, and, not, and realizing that all of this doesn't really matter that as much as you are tempted to think it does. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5, Hebrews 13 and verse number 5, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Do not live in such a way so that you demonstrate you are led by desires. How do you do that? Be content with what things you have. Be satisfied with what you have. Don't fall prey to the habit of thinking, I need to have more, I want to have more, and if I have more, I will arrive, I will be satisfied, I will be filled. You'll never be filled. Satan will always make sure that there is something better or more to have. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why is that put there? Because if you recognize I have Jesus, then you don't worry so much about what it is you do or don't have besides Jesus. And in fact, if you realize that, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. The fear of God is eternal, but we don't have to fear God if we have considered our days properly and if we are content with what we have. And then number two, we need to prioritize and set meaningful steps to obtain the only thing worth having. A powerful but a vivid picture in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1. It says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. Why? Because you died, as verse 3 says, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When you really understand that there is no hope in this world at all, then you will build your hopes on things eternal. That's the action that is needed. But that's not all that's needed, and that's not all the psalm talks about. The second thing that is a response, a natural response of the awareness of impermanence is adoration, worship. You might not think a psalm where uh, Moses is maybe coming to grips with his mortality would be a time where he would, he would think, I need to worship God. Because usually death brings us into, like I said, a position of fear. Moses says, I don't want to live in fear. I don't want to worry about my sins. I know my God will take care of that. 
I want to have the wisdom I need to consider my days properly because God is great and God is good. Time is filled with swift transition. Nothing of earth can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. That, that's the other thought that really comes across in this, in this hymn. Trust in him who will not leave you. Whatsoever years may bring, if by earthly friends forsaken, still more closely to him cling. God wants desperately to be the constant in your life. He wants to be your hope in life. And again, when you make him your hope in life, there will never be a hopeless moment in life. There'll never be a time where you really are so down and out where you say, what in the world am I going to do? Because you'll know God is there. And you'll know his way of escape is there. And you'll know that you're going to be able to get onto the other side of that moment. Again, casting our eyes back at Psalm 90, the psalmist was aware of his impermanence. He was aware of the danger of wrath. He was aware of the need for wisdom. But what is that, what is that thought contained in for him? This determination, this desire to make God his dwelling place. As we go back to Psalm 90, Psalm 90 Verse 1, the world is impermanent. And so he says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all our generations. You were the constant. You were always there. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you were God. Is God your dwelling place? Is he where you want to be? And is being with him everything to you? One of the sad things that came as a product of that, of that whole pandemic period was just a, a demonstration of people's lack of desire to be with brothers and sisters in Christ. Across the brotherhood, that happened so often where people just weren't, it, their hearts weren't there. I know there are times when our bodies can't be there. There's a lot of good reasons for us not to be there. But where are our hearts in those moments? There is still, even to this day, a, a, a group of people who feel like they can be satisfied living the Christian life isolated and away from other believers, away from effectively the place where God said he was. If God dwells in the church collectively, then his desire is for us to dwell collectively together, to be with each other, to cling to his people, even as we cling to him. And so what is our, where, where, where is our desire to be? There's going to be a lot of temptation. There is always temptation with every summer. Summer rolls around. I want to go places. I want to do things. But please do not give in to that temptation when it comes to Sunday to, to use that day too, to make that day no different than any other day. Because God is. He's real on that day too. He's real on every day. And if you're going to make anything of this life, I know it's okay to, to, to have fun. You know, God created Alaska. He knew it was a fun place to be, obviously. All right? It's okay to do that, but do not forget about God. Do not forget about his people. Don't go and be satisfied. If, you live in a, if, you're, if you're in a place where, where the church is meeting, don't say, I'll just watch an online service. Go and be with the people of God. Be in the presence of God. Spend time with God's people. And spend time in adoration of your God. As I think further about the thought of Psalm 90, and I think further about the situations in which we find ourselves in, it's not just a temptation in good times. Adoration, um, you know, has to abide in difficult times too. But adoration doesn't mean you have to enjoy your situation. The psalmist is aware that there's a certain impermanence brought upon by sin, but he's also aware of the difficulties uh, that, that he's facing and has faced. And he's actually calling uh, to, to, to really God, give him the, give him the wisdom to, to reflect upon you and your, and your constancy in the midst of all this difficulty. In verse number 15, it says, uh, Make us glad according to you the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Again, if this was written by Moses as the heading says it was, Moses had a lot of bad years, a lot of difficult years, a lot of trying years. And so he says, help me to understand that. Help me to be, be, be glad in that. Help me to continue to adore you in that. He's calling in this verse, uh, in, this, in this hymn uh, for wisdom, but he's also asking God to return. That's okay. Verse 13, return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. That's okay. It's okay in moments of difficulty to turn to God with doubts and fears and desires and requests. In fact, that's exactly what he wants you to do. 
And it's exactly what Satan wants you to do to miss on that opportunity to cast your cares upon God and to try to solve it yourself. God is, again, not a God of wrath. He is a God of love. He delights in mercy. He wants to be merciful, and he wants to hear from you. Adoration isn't just the praise that we offer in the good times. It's the prayerful requests we offer in the bad ones. It's who we turn to at all times. And if we will do that, if we'll cast our cares upon God, as a part of a life where we are seeking security in him, if our hopes are rooted and grounded in him, aware of the impermanence of life, aware of the difficulties and what they represent, aware of the opportunity to to, to dwell forever in a place of wrath, aware of all of that, but then still acting and, and adoring God. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, fair and bright, the home and glory your enraptured soul will view. What a wonderful blessing awaits the faithful. What a wonderful opportunity then life represents. Christians, this morning as you, as you think about your place in life, is there a situation in which you feel hopeless? Is there, is there a, a, a part of your life that, that you feel you just don't have control over? You can't get it back. Is there something that you feel slipping away from you or an opportunity that you're scared about missing? Build your hopes on things eternal. God has some guidance for those moments and God will give you help. And I hope that we can begin this summer's reflections with that in our hearts and minds. If you need something though this morning, if we can help you in any way, let us know. We would love to talk to you about the saving gospel of Jesus and about how to be baptized into him. We would love to talk to you about how to build your hopes on things eternal. And we would love to pray with you if you're finding that whole process challenging. Let us know how we can help while we sing the song of invitation.